Hi, I'm Jack Grimmer at Wickham Wanderers, and you're listening to Wickham Sound. The Wickham Wanderers Show. Welcome to episode four, series five uh, of the Wickham Wanderers Show. This happens every season. I feel... <laughs> Start counting, I and mean, then you just forget. Or well, it just gets too many, or people just aren't interested. I uh, hope you're well. Hope you've had a good week, and uh, a lot's happened since we last spoke. We've had a win against Rotherham at Adams Park, and a fantastic victory in the second round of the Carabao Cup uh, against uh, Swansea City. And if you missed it, uh, the third round draw has been made, and um, putting Wickham Wanderers at home at Adams Park against Champions League, Premier League, Aston Villa, uh, which will be taking place. Uh, next month plenty to look forward to there we'll review and preview uh, that action and also look ahead to the trip to Blackpool on Saturday as well uh, with Phil with our match briefing in a few moments time uh, also coming up in the next hour thanks to the Wickham Wanderers X Players Association we'll speak to legendary captain Glenn Creaser uh, there's a theme to this year's annual dinner in November of 30 years in the Football League uh, Creaser of course led the club uh, to back to back promotions uh, from the conference and also what was then the third division uh, beating Gareth Ainsworth Preston in the playoff final at Wembley David Moyes of course is in that side as well uh, we'll hear from him very soon uh, Chris not David Moyes um, also it's the start of Wickham Wanderers women's season this weekend uh, they're at home to Porchester at Burnham uh, Darcy will uh, give us a bit of a roundup of uh, uh, what's been going on in the pre-season and uh, some of the new signings and lots more as well. Uh, plus, we'll hear from Jeremy Sauer, who's the academy director at the club, and also we'll hear from manager Matt Bloomfield. They're looking ahead to Saturday's trip to Blackpool, which hopefully uh, Phil will be fit for, because if you're listening to the commentary last night, you'll know that, uh, unfortunately, he failed a late fitness test. Uh, but I'm very pleased to say uh, we can hear from him uh, this week on the show. <laughs> Yeah, I'm uh, added to the injury list of the club. Uh, not injury, but yeah, Ill, Ill actually. Uh, yeah, very heavy cold, uh, which completely floored me yesterday. Uh, I'm uh, I'm a lot better today, uh, which I'm very happy about. So I'm I'm uh, I'm looking very I'm looking good for Blackpool away, which is excellent. So yeah, I don't miss many games. Uh, in fact, I was trying to think of how many I've missed down the years, and uh, it's not many at all. So uh, yeah, um, but it was lovely to um, be able to to take the game in from home. And uh, and check out what it's like to be a fan uh, in that respect. Um, so yeah, it's a really good game. Uh, but yeah, feeling much better. Thank you, Colin. No, really pleased. Hopefully, uh, it won't be too too uh, late decision for your for your fitness for for, for Blackpool. Uh, absolutely not. Uh, I'll be. Uh, I'll uh, I'll make sure I'm uh, I'm not contagious. That's the main thing. I don't want to be bringing germs in into the club or the camp. So uh, yeah, I'll make sure I'm fully fit. But yeah, vitamin C up to my eyeballs uh, and looking after myself. So uh, I'll be I'll be back on Saturday. And such a pleasing display last night. A, it's quite unusual to speak to you, you know, the day after a game anyway, because, well, they don't usually happen on a Wednesday apart from anything. But it, it was, it was so, so pleasing to see, you know, such a, a resolute display from the team. Yeah, it was excellent, I thought. Um, you know, Swansea away, a championship side, a former Premier League team. Uh, they've got a real identity of how they play football. Um, quite amusing to see a lot of their fans extremely confident when the draw was made. Um, but Wickham know better than, than most clubs, really, that, these cup competitions can be a really good leveller. And watching the game last night, I thought we, we played some excellent football. Uh, we're by far the better side in the first half, especially uh, taking the ball forwards um, and fully deserved the one nil lead at half time. And, uh, and yeah, I don't think Swansea could really have any complaints. I mean, Ramazzoli didn't have a save to make uh, during the, during the 90 minutes. Um, and this was a, a patched up Wickham side, really, when you look at the injury list. Uh, but it's, it's testament to the squad that's been assembled, really, that we have a lot of injuries, but it's opened the door. When when people are unavailable, they've always said it's, it then creates opportunities for other people. We've known about Declan Skura for a long time. He had a fantastic loan spell at Ebbsfleet last season in, in what was a really tough environment to go into, uh, a team scrapping for their survival in the National League. Um, and he was there for the second half of last season in, in, in a time where they turned their form and results around and stayed in the league. That would have been fantastic for him to be in that environment and, and to play regular senior football uh, at a decent level. And I think last night we saw um, the results of that. And, you know, it would have come as no surprise to, to the, the likes of Sam Grace and the other people around the club uh, that Declan played that way last night. Um, of course, it's different when you know what they can do in training and, and what you've seen and what you've identified and what you've worked on. 
but to see them cross the white line in a, a championship stadium against the championship side and perform like that um, would have been incredibly heartening for uh, the Wickham coaching staff, as it was for the Wickham fans. And I think Jasper Patton, that's probably his finest game for Wickham Wanderers. Um, uh, right back initially uh, into right wing back later in the second half, a position he's, he's often said um, was was his more, more favoured position. Um, but I thought he was excellent, very disciplined in his defensive roles last night. Um, quick, physical, uh, looked to get forwards. Um, so they were really, really encouraging. And then, you know, along with our, you know, seasoned pros like Joe Lowe and, and Alex Hartridge back there, you know, a, a fantastic clean sheet and shutout. But more importantly, in cup football, Colin, it's all about the result. Uh, a 1-0 win into the third round draw. And, and after the game, uh, Matt, Matt Cecil spoke to Matt Bloomfield and he was delighted too. Matt, the night belongs to Wickham Wanderers. You must be so proud. Yeah, immensely proud. Um, you know, to to be manager of our football club on, on a night like this, you know, um, you know, this this competition was really fortunate, really um, good to us a few years ago when we got to the semi final. And I've seen the gaffer enjoy lots of nights like this you know, in the period of time that he was with us for ten years. So to be able to stand at the front and, and celebrate with the boys was yeah, a really special moment. It's such a tough place to come, a side that likes to dominate the ball, but actually the way the team set up and executed the plan uh, must be such a proud moment for you. Yeah, because it was a quick turnaround from, from the weekend, coming into these midweek games, so we had a little bit of time on the training ground yesterday to try and um, put our ideas across to the boys. Um, you know, Swansea averaged 63% possession at, at, uh, in the Championship, so you know, it'd be silly and foolish of us not to expect them to be the, the possession-dominant team this evening, so we had to make sure we were really, really um, secure out of possession. Um, but I also asked the boys to to look after it when we had it you know I want, want us to play with the identity that we've been building and evolving you know it was going to be tough for us to be the possession dominant team tonight but when we had it we needed to make the most of it and, and I thought we did especially in the first half we created some you know, really good opportunities I made a note of 11 names that weren't involved tonight that looked quite a strong team the 11 that did perform have certainly given you headaches and, and not so much headaches but exciting opportunities ahead for the season now that we've got such strength in depth yeah I think it's you know it was it was always going to be an interesting one tonight we had to protect a few bodies from knocks at the weekend and the quick turnaround to Saturday um, it was an ideal opportunity to have a look at Alex Hartridge as a left full back um, Declan Score has been you know we've had high hopes for him for a couple of years now so we've been itching to give him an opportunity and you know we had to be a little bit careful with, with Cam with his distances you know he's been injured at Ipswich there's loads of things in the melting pot that you know the names that are back at Harlington is you know could 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 get in anyone's team so um, yeah it was obviously um, a challenge for us but we believed in the group we put out and we've been trying to evolve the, the style and making sure everyone's um, dialed in with that so yeah there's been a few opportunities given tonight and they've absolutely taken and uh, really pleasing to hear from the manager and also as you touched on you know two of those names must be so pleasing for them as well to have, have had that non-league experience and now you know competing well against the championship opposition yeah, that was, um, you know, one end of the table, uh, one end of the pitch, sorry, is, is the defence. And then at the other end, you look up and see someone like Richard Kone, who we have to remember, um, only signed at the start of the year in January the 1st when the transfer window opened. Um, I think the Wickham Twitter feed last night said that uh, on this day last year, so 12 months ago, he scored a brace against Little Oakley in the uh, Essex Senior League. And there was Richard Kone last night scoring a decisive goal against Championship Swansea uh, at the Liberty Stadium. Um, it's been a meteoric rise for Richard Kone. Um, and I think, you know, it's, it's a good time to reflect on that journey that he's been on and is on. Um, and because it's been phenomenal, really. Um, he's missed a few chances at the start of this season. He's still got two goals and a couple of assists. Um, no doubt as a striker, he will tell you he should have had more. There'll be some Wickham fans who think he should have had more. He has a great chance against Wimbledon. But he's a real fantastic striker, all-round striker. And it's fantastic to see him, you know, leading the line down the middle. And I think, as as we've seen, the the, the growth curve that he's on, uh, it's phenomenal. And I think we're going to see a fantastic double-figure striker here for Wickham Wanderers, uh, plucked from non-league and, and delivering the goods in the Football League. Um, and, in, you know, it was nice to hear from, from Richard again after the game last night. Yeah, really, really from what where I started and the common score here against HM, really, really good side. Um, I can just be proud of myself and the boys as well. Without them, I wouldn't have been scoring the goal, but it was good. Last August, you scored twice against Little Oakley first. Do you remember those goals? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> a year is a long time in football, yeah, isn't it? To yeah, come from the Essex yeah. 
uh, senior league, inter league football. Um, it just shows, doesn't it, that hard work really does pay off for yeah. the youngsters. But but not just yourself, Jasper from Worthing and, and Franco at Eastbourne and, and Declan from Kingstonian. There is a great pathway for, for non league players into the football league. Yeah, yeah, there's so much talent in non league. I've, I've seen a lot of good players, really, really good players. And I think non league as well, not just just to play only, but it forces you as well, give you experience, and when you get to the league, professional league, is, I think if you believe in yourself and what you got from there, you can go forward. I think really nice, as you say, to hear from him, but also to see and uh, to chart his progress, as you say, especially with his story. And I guess as a commentator and fan as well, you get really excited when when he's on the ball in, in a dangerous position. Yeah, it's he kind of makes things happen, doesn't he? Um... He's fearless, really. It was interesting. We had Beryl Labala on, on co-commentary a couple of times already this season. And obviously, it's a position that he knows well up front. Uh, he knows Richard very well. And, and the senior players in the squad have had a really good impact on, on those younger development players that we've mentioned in our chat. Uh, and Richard Kona is no exception to that. And it's that fearlessness that he's brought with him from, from non-league. Um, and also his in his life really uh, you know he's he's come he's he's overcome lots of challenges and, and issues to kind of get to Wickham Wanderers to you know have to wait it out and be patient and get his chance to be able to sign for pro club um you know and the physical side of his game has been incredibly well developed in non league uh, he's added the finesse to that now um with being at, at full time Wickham Wanderers um but yeah just to see that that rise you know, I think we need to be as a fan base. We need to to sometimes just take stock of it a bit and think. You know, he's come a long way already. We all know, though, that we think he can go the whole way, uh, which is brilliant, and it'll be brilliant for him. It'll be brilliant for the club. But there will be peaks and troughs in that journey. Um, and I think this season is is a is a really defining season for Richard Kone. Uh And I think that, that the fans have really taken him to their hearts, and um, I'm looking forward to seeing him get get near that double figures sooner rather than later. An extra special last night to see on the club's social media the players' reaction to the third round draw. Yeah, yeah, on the bus, uh, wonderful. Um, and this is what it's all about. And, you know, there's a lot of criticism again last night for for the organisation of this tournament about the the way that the top six were kept apart. Um, I don't think a, a team from outside the supposed big top six has, has won this tournament uh, for many, many, many years. So we're not entirely sure why the seeding. Or a lot of fans were saying we're not entirely sure why the seeding is, is in place. I know it's a logistical thing about um, game weeks and Champions League and there's two European weeks now and all the other bits and pieces. But um, from a Wickham point of view, it, it gave them a really good shot at getting one of those big clubs. And, and to bring uh, a Champions League team to Adams Park um, is a fantastic opportunity uh, for the club. Uh, all round, it's a fantastic opportunity on the pitch to test themselves against uh, uh, one of the big hitters. Uh, it's a fantastic opportunity off the pitch and in the community as well to really make some inroads uh, into connecting with hopefully new fans and, and bringing people to Adams Park for what will hopefully be a, a fantastic night under the lights. And fans will obviously remember previous encounters between the two. There's the, the 2016 FA Cup uh, game at Adams Park, of course, and the replay at Villa Park. And obviously that, that uh, uh, same competition, same stage as well in uh, 2005. Yeah, um, the 2005 one uh, particularly pertinent because um, I, you know, I just referenced there about connecting with the community, about having a fantastic night under the lights. Uh, I remember being on the terrace that night uh, watching Wickham Wanderers against uh, John Gorman's uh, Wickham Wanderers uh, and being incredibly excited at half time as Wickham headed down the tunnel with a 3 1 lead, having rips Aston Villa apart. Uh, and then I don't know what David O'Leary said at half time, but um, it certainly worked because Aston Villa then scored seven goals in the second half uh, to win it comfortably 8-3. Uh, chatting to John Gorman, who's a fantastic character, as I'm sure you're aware, um, a couple of years ago about this. And he still bemoans, uh, I think, the, a refereeing decision in the second half, <laughs> uh, which he thought maybe turned the game, which I think is uh, is fantastic optimism and positivity, which kind of sums up the great man. Uh, that, that that stole that result away from Wickham Wanderers, but um, look, obviously we're going to be um, you know second favourites by by some margin going into that game. Um, but as I said earlier on, cup football in this country is built on on upsets, and you know Wimbledon in the second division beat Premier League Ipswich last night on penalties, um, and because of the Champions League and the rigours of of European football at the top level and Premier League schedules, um, it's likely that Aston Villa may make some changes. Um, they have a fantastic youth development and under. 21 squad and, and access to young players so um you know they may not bring their their full first string uh, but it'll still be a really really good test 
Uh, I'm really hopeful they bring their goalkeeper though to have an Argentinian keeper uh, in the opposition goal uh, and a World Cup winner would be would be a real cool to see someone like that at Adams Park. No, absolutely, excellent. Lots to look forward to uh, next month, and of course, more more recently, we've got a, a trip to, to Blackpool. Yes, Blackpool early kickoff as well. Just what you need after a, a grueling Wednesday night. Uh, kickoff midweek. Uh, I mean, the boys are staying away all week now. I think they're, they're heading up to Blackpool as we speak or in that area uh, and then we'll enjoy their company, each other's company up until uh, that game. Uh, and yeah, 12.30 kickoff on Saturday um, against a team that is very difficult to gauge, actually, what we're going to come up against on Saturday. Uh, they fired their manager, Neil Critchley, after two games. Um, Richard Keogh, obviously a, a man we know very well. Uh, Matt Bloomfield knows him even better. Uh, he's an interim charge. Uh, and his first game in charge was uh, fairly entertaining. Uh, they were 4-1 up away at Cambridge. Uh, drew it 4 all. Um, so they'd be disappointed with that. But um, chatting to a, a Blackpool fan in the week for pre-match drills and Wanderers TV, uh, he was saying that there were huge amounts of positives uh, to take from that. Uh, you know, noticeably that they did score four goals and and, and the passion and and the team identity seemed to be uh, regained. They had a brilliant result themselves in the midweek as well, an away win at Championship Blackburn, uh, somewhere they haven't won since the 1970s, and have got themselves a decent draw against Sheffield Wednesday in round three of the, of the League Cup too. So they've they've had a good week uh, under Richard Keogh. Uh, as we speak. Uh, we don't know if a new manager is going to be in place. I suspect not. So uh, we'll be seeing a former chair boy in the dugout up against us on Saturday. Um, and I think Wickham can go into it with confidence. Um, I think we've had some stern tests at the start of this season. Uh, Wrexham away, Birmingham at home. Um, I thought, you know, we've now seen uh, further results now as the league is starting to unfold. And, and narrow defeats, uh, two defeats admittedly, but narrow defeats. Um, in context, um, I think we're, we're perhaps a little unlucky in some of those games. But looking what they've done to, to other teams since then, uh, they've been interesting results. Um, I thought we dispatched Rotherham uh, with relative ease, uh, especially in the second half, having sucked up some pressure. Um, so I'm really looking forward to seeing where we can sort of pitch ourselves once we uh, know the outcome of Saturday against uh, a Blackpool who is incredibly unpredictable. And they say, you know, don't they win, wins breed confidence and, and to have two on the bounce now, it, it must, must you know, really lift the team. Absolutely. Um, you know, and th- this week away for them, I think, will be fantastic as well. There's obviously a couple of new faces uh, that have come through in Aaron Morley and Cameron Humphreys. Uh, Gideon Kajua, obviously, we know uh, from last season. But again, kudos to him for an excellent performance at Swansea. And uh, it looks like he's really... Uh, got the bit between his teeth to continue what he started at Wickham with those 10 appearances he made last season. So that's really exciting that we've got another option out wide too. Uh, and and look, the window's still open. Um, the window will close whilst Wickham are in Blackpool on Friday night at 11pm. Um, and who knows what will happen between now and then. Um, and uh, well, yeah, we'll have to wait and see. No, I'm sure fans will be you know really keen to have the, the team strengthened, as you say, especially with the injuries that we've had. Yeah, the injury list is is not ideal. Um, but as I said earlier on, um, looking around last night at the squad um, and and that back four in particular, um, you wouldn't know that there were two uh, relatively new people there from the from the development setup uh, in that starting lineup. The way that the the team performed as a unit, as a defensive unit, uh, and that's fantastic. You know, the, the injury list has presented opportunities to people, uh, and certainly from last night that they delivered on those opportunities. Oh, much to look forward to. Enjoy the game yourself. Thank you very much, Colin. I hope to make it. <laughs> Great chatting to uh, Phil, who unfortunately missed the uh, the Swansea game, although he did watch it at home with his son Felix, which was a fantastic opportunity, which you wouldn't normally get. Uh, but uh, Phil improving uh, his his cold conditions. You can catch, of course, uh, the chats with Richard Kone and uh, the manager Matt Bloomfield after last night's game at Swansea on Wanderers TV. You can hear more about Richard Kone's thoughts on uh, his scoring and also Matt Bloomfield talking about the fantastic support uh, at uh, Swansea last night as well. As uh, Phil mentioned, if you're listening to this live, thank you. Uh, (laughs) And also thank you if you're listening not live as well. Uh, The transfer window closes at 11 o'clock tomorrow evening, so there could be uh, more perhaps comings and goings uh, between now and then. We'll be following that, of course, uh, here on Wickham Sound as well. And also next week, due to be playing uh, Mansfield, but it is the international break, uh, so depending on uh, the number of call-ups for either side, uh, that could uh, determine whether that game goes ahead. Uh, we'll still have a show next week, though. It'll still be entertaining. You'll like it. Uh, Phil's already said he's going to be on whatever. Across High Wycombe and South Buckinghamshire and on your smart speaker. 
Play Wickham Sound. This is Wickham Sound. Part two of this week's Wickham Wanderer show. Part three is pretty good as well. Stick around for that. Uh, we'll hear from the manager, Matt Bloomfield, ahead of the trip to Bloomfield Road uh, on Saturday. It's a 12 30 kickoff against Blackpool. We'll also catch up with a new academy director, and Darcy will uh, preview Wickham Wanderers' women's opening league game of the season on Sunday. Uh, that's, of course, at Burnham. It's a two o'clock kickoff if you're planning on going along. But first, with big thanks to the Wickham Wanderers Ex Players Association, I've uh, got a bit of a, a theme coming up in the coming episodes of this show as well as we build up to the uh, Ex Players Association annual dinner in November, and uh, the theme is 30 years in the Football League and a fantastic place to start would be to speak to uh, the very first uh, member of the Wickham Wanderers Ex Player Association that we had on uh, Series 1 of this programme. He's known as the Enforcer. Uh, he is, of course, Glenn Creaser, who led the club uh, into the Football League and uh, been catching up with him this afternoon to speak about uh, all manner of things, including that uh, playoff final against Preston in 94 at Wembley and also his thoughts on being offered a first professional contract by Martin O'Neill. I guess to some extent it was a bit of a surprise in one way because obviously I've just come back from having an accident with a, with a forklift. So it was one of them where it was, I just needed to get myself back to a, a point of being able to play and then Martin would, would say yes or no. So, And thankfully, he offered me. So, And did it take much adjustment for, you, for yourself and obviously the rest of the team as well? Because I guess, you know, to go from playing teams like Fisher Athletic and Kettering to, to suddenly that, that famous trip to Carlisle? It, yeah, I think, yeah, to vaguely remember, I think uh, Keith Ryan and Matty Crossley saying something about, you know, the change from playing part time to full time and getting used to the pace of the games and, and it being uh, obviously that step up. But I think the fact that we were quite strong as a group of players anyway, I think helped, uh, helped everybody get through it. And of course, Martin brought in a few few experienced heads to, to sort of, you know, strengthen the spine of the side and allow us to be able to play. Did you have expectations as to what it might be like for playing in the Football League? Didn't have a clue. I knew it was obviously going to be quicker and so on and so forth, but um, until you actually go in and do it, then you don't, you don't really you don't have that experience. And whilst we had played against some league sides in the FA Cup and, you know, what have you, and, and um, some reasonable friendlies and stuff like that, you know, you, you get an idea about kind of what it's going to be like, but you never really know until you start playing. And luckily, we we finished what fourth in the league the first year, and managed to beat Preston in the playoff final. Did at the time that feel like such an amazing achievement? Because I think uh, Wickham were the first club, weren't they, to, to to really you know win the the conference, but also then get promoted that that season as well, the next season. Yeah, I think I had a, I had, we had a really good start to the season. I remember that, and then obviously I got injured in the January. And then things changed around a little bit, but the lads were absolutely brilliant for the back end of the season, and ended up winning it quite convincingly. So, yeah, I think I think the the camaraderie amongst the players and the togetherness amongst the players really, really helped us. That's for sure, because uh, we had been together for quite a long time. And I think when you have that sort of rapport with people, whether it's on the pitch or off of it, it can only go and make you stronger. As you say, it was a real kind of almost ever-present sort of lineup, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, to a large extent. I mean, the gaffer made changes when he thought it was the right thing to do, you know, to vary it up a little bit. But we had, a, you know, the structure, if you look at it, I mean, you could, if you was to ask anybody around at the time, you could go Kerr, Crossley, Creaser, Cousins, Brian, Stapleton, um, Steve Guppy, Dave Carroll, Keith Scott, well, at the time, Mark West and Kim Casey and and uh, Turns, you know, there was, you know, quite a lot. Pretty consistent. Are there particular things that especially stand out in your mind from that first season? Being involved, being involved um, all, all, all the time, even if I wasn't involved in the, in the, in the, uh, the playing side for the for the first part of it, um, but just being there with the lads, you know, supporting them, helping them out, doing whatever the gaffer needed done, and you know, and then obviously, unfortunately, Big Tell got injured at Fulham uh, when he done his ligaments, and I was in the position that Martin said, "Right, you, you're coming in." And don't get me wrong, I had some stinkers. You know, I had some, I had some rascals. I think he'll always remember the Chester game. I was, I mean, I might as well have stayed at home. Yeah, I was awful that night. Christ, um, he wanted the ground to open up and swallow me in. You know, but you know, beyond that, we we uh, we did okay. You know, it's it's weird. You just you just go out there and try and do your best, as is what we expected from everybody anyway. And were you aware of perhaps your influence in the team and how, kind of obviously, being the captain and that sort of leadership responsibility and how you know, people could come to you as well? 
Yeah, I, mean, I, I think it was more a case of I was there, so if they needed, you know, not like a shoulder to cry on or whatever, but, um, you know, we'd, we'd always talk and, you know, we'd never, we'd never, we never, we, there was a kind of, you kind of knew when somebody wasn't right, if that makes sense. Um, because you've been, I mean, I've been with most of those boys since 1988 when I first went to Wickham. And, um, yeah, so all of them pretty much I said spent five or six years with. Um, and you, you kind of pick up on, on vibes from people and uh, house things and everything all right. If you saw someone that looked particularly low, which was very, very rare, I have to say, um, you know, you, you just, you know, offered them a shoulder or an ear to, to, to talk to you and help them out. But, I, I, you know, I didn't, yeah. I mean, I get him, the lads have, for some reason, got a, it would appear to be a, a huge amount of respect for me, but I'm, I'm still baffled as to why sometimes. <laughs> but, um, but we, well, again, we meet up once, we try and meet up once a year down in London and get together and have a beer and have a chat. And basically, it's like rolling back the clock and you, you're sitting there having a chat like you would do in before a game or after a game. You know, it's uh, it's weird. It's, it's, and it's special. I think that's a, the word for me. It's, it's a special relationship. It's incredible that you've still got that bond, isn't it? And like you say, I must sort of take you back to, to that time, even as it was, you know, so long ago. Yeah, yeah. I mean, listen, I mean, we created some fantastic memories, you know, um, playing playing in big games and, and um, you know, managing to get that result against Preston to get us up again. Yeah, it was, it, yeah, it was lots and lots and lots of special times we had. And, uh well, you know, it's, it's, it's great to be able to reminisce with the lads and they'll always remember little things that somebody did on a particular occasion and, you know, and then you have the mickey taken out of you in the same way as you did 30 years ago. But, um, yeah, so that nothing's changed from that perspective. So what was the build-up to the, the final like? Uh, as you would imagine, it was um, very well organised. We, we, spe- we spent some time, now you're going to ask me, you know, I think it was over, I think it was Sopwell. Um, so I know we did one at um, Burnham. That was in the '91. Yeah, that was, I'm sure it was. It was Sopwell House we stayed at. Um, yeah, so it, the organisation and the, you know the training and the, you know the, the discussions that were being had around who's going to do what, where, when, how, and so on and so forth. It was um, it was special, but it was very very well organised. Weirdo, bless him. He used to I think chasing chase his tail trying to find hotels for us to stay in and. You know, make sure we had all the right facilities and everything else like that. So we never left any, Martin and, and, the, and the, his team never certainly left, left anything to chance. And of course, we had the experience of like Steve Walford and, and um, John Robertson, Paul Franklin at the time. You know, we had people that, that had been around the game a long time and you could only offer their their experience and share and, you know, give you some tips and, and say, oh, perhaps you need to do this better. But um, yeah, it was just exciting, as you can imagine. And we've been lucky. We went there three times, didn't we? In, in our in our time, ninety one, ninety three, ninety four, whatever it was. So uh, the, the, I think the the second and third time was much easier for the boys in terms of knowing what to expect. If you get my meaning. And fascinating how the, the game sort of panned out, wasn't it? Because obviously going behind, uh, but but equalising so soon with with Steve Thompson's goal as well. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah, and of course Dave Carroll scored too, didn't he? Yeah. Um, I mean that move for me is one of the well it's a fantastic goal um, well worked the awareness of Simon Garner he looks over his shoulder he just hooked it around the corner to Dave and he, he, he washes up and sight puts it in brilliant and then of course then Dave decides to go on amazing um, what a goal that was so uh, yeah and when you get that you get that cushion it's, it, I think everybody goes wow thank God for that you know um, but uh yeah, it was, it was it was really good, really really good. And obviously the celebrations afterwards, I'm sure, were were, were memorable as well. I, I can't remember. <laughs> um, anybody that does, I think I'll call them a liar. I think, you know, we, we, as you would imagine, we, you know, like we always did when we when we did well and we won things, we we celebrated and we did, and we did that hard and we were good at it. <laughs> um, but all in good spirits, you know. It wasn't, you know, it was all, you know. <clears throat> when you have when you go and do something like that, you you know. You have to still show respect for people in general and and behave in the right manners and st- all sort of stuff. So um, yeah, it was uh, yeah it was yeah it was a party when it so it was. I don't know when it finished. <laughs> <laughs> Jenny T was telling me it's a, a humorous story where yourself and, and Simon Garner's suits got a bit mixed up. Oh yeah yeah Garner yeah. 
Yeah, I was going to call him saying him, but I thought maybe I won't do that. <laughs> um, yeah, we was we were sharing a room, and I, I, I was fidgeting. I was, I was on match day, and uh, I went to put my suit on and put me put me trans, and I was like, "Bloody hell, guns!" I said, I ain't, "My strides don't fit them. I, should, I didn't even try them. I just picked my suit up because they'd done all the measurements." He was lying on the bed wetting himself. He was absolutely killing himself laughing. I was like, "Oh, you punk!" So he's putting my trousers on his peg. And my his trousers are mine, but it was it was funny at the time. And of course, <laughs> you see a six foot four bloke wearing a pair of ge- pair of trousers of a five foot ten bloke or whatever he is. It, it does look quite kind of comical. Um, and if it, if it had been the case that, that that they got it wrong and I had to wear them, I would have worn them. So <laughs> it was yeah, that was that was quite that was quite funny. And I'm sure as well, you can't underestimate how important the the influence of the manager was in in, in your success as well. Yep, yeah, he came, well, Martin, when Martin came in at uh, Lunch Park, he made a, a pretty um, significant impact, sort of pretty much straight away. Made it very clear about what he wanted and to a large extent who he wanted. And to some extent, um, Jim Kelman had done a fantastic job of putting a large number of the group that Martin took over and, if you like, adopted. It was uh, much the same group. It was just a, a case of finding the right. Um, the right balance, I guess, and so you know, different managers have different expectations. But um, Martin would always try and play as much as he could. But you know, you can't hurt play, you can't hurt teams when you're defending your eighteen yard box. You just got to get it into places where you can affect theirs. Um, but yeah, it was always uh, it's always well organised in that sense. It was it was, um, it was about trying to win football matches with him. So. He didn't do bad at it, did he? <laughs> no, definitely. And was there a real sense throughout the team that you, that really gave you such a boost in that you know we, we've got into the football league and now we've got out of the third division as well? Did did you feel a lot more sort of not invincible, but you know that you could take on any newcomers really? I mean, yeah, I think everybody believed that. I mean, and then because well, when Martin did scream for them, I mean, he big, big, bought big C, so all you see, and he had Simon Garner in, got a few lads from the north, north, northern, northern section. I think D Turnbull came down, Big Terry came over from Brentford, and you know we had one or two others come in as well. So it just that just sort of kind of shored us up a little bit, which which obviously had, had um, helped, and we managed to sustain our position in that division, didn't we? No, absolutely. And um, was there a real feeling from yourself as well that you you really achieved something special? Well, I thought that after 1991, if I'm honest, because I was I was saying to JDT the other day, I was I was talking to Nicky Evans in the car, we were going to a game, and I said to him, "Well, you, you've been to Wembley, Nick," and he's like, "Yeah, yeah, I went there with Kettering, and we had a chat about it." And at that time, I think I was 31, and of course, it turned it turns out that we got there. Well, we got we we got there three times, and then I went there again with Dagenham in the FA Trophy final against Woking, which oddly enough, um, Stevie Thompson popped up in. <laughs> yeah, it was, there was loads and loads of special moments with with getting it was getting to that place, is, you know, and especially the old Wembley, where obviously we won the World Cup and all the history that goes behind that. Yeah, it was all it was all special, really special. And as you say, at that stage in your career as well. Yeah, being an old fart, as it were, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, because that, you know, if you like the older statement, also, I was just thinking this morning, I can't remember how old Keith Ryan is, but I mean, I think I had probably 10 years on most of them, because they was all all young, weren't they? Stevie Guppy come out, I think, south, out of Southampton. Uh, they're, 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 um, whatever section, they're under 18s or whatever it was, I'm sure that's where he came from. And and I think everybody was of a similar sort of, similar sort of age, but... So I would have had 10, if not more, years on most of them. I must wish you a happy yeah. birthday, because I understand you've got, got a significant birthday coming up at the weekend. Yeah, it's significant. Yeah, still don't get me pension, though, because they, <laughs> they're, they're moving all that now. So they're moving all that, putting them, putting the prices up of all the gas and electric and everything else and, you know, doing the, all, the, all the stuff that people don't want them to do. But, um, yeah, significant birthday, 65. Uh, and to be fair... I'm, grateful to be here absolutely especially after your, your health care i hope you're well uh, at the moment as well yeah yeah i'm fine yeah we've we've been away me and uh, andrew have been away we've spent some time down in torquay seeing some family and it was really lovely down there it's uh, like they say the uh english riviera it was it was stunning down there beautiful part of the country and now we're basking in sun in sunny egham with some more family so yeah it's all good 
Oh, it's really nice to hear that, that you're doing well. And, and do you sort of watch football differently as a result? Because you, you speak to some players and they, you know, they, they sort of want to be quite sort of distant from it. But, but having the experiences that you had, does, does it make you kind of still, still have that kind of hunger to, to, to see the, the younger up and coming players, especially in your position, I guess? Oh well, yeah, for sure. I mean, I keep an eye on obviously. I keep an eye on um, Wickham's results. I keep an eye on Chelsea's results because they're my lifelong team. And I also um, help out a, a, to a club called Milton Keynes Irish Football Club in Milton Keynes with a pal of mine who's, um, who asked me to go down and give him a hand. And um, yeah, so we, we we're there three times a week: Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. And um, yeah, we love it. I mean, I said to Andrew, I said, like being around the, the, the lads, it like, keeps you young, you know, because they have the crack, they have the banter in the same way as we used to. And you never lose that, you know, you always, you've always got that there, you know. So yeah, I do keep an eye on the results and stuff like that, yeah. So might be just in fleeting glances at times, but yeah, I do keep an eye on it. Does it feel like it was 30 years ago or does it feel like it was comparatively recent? It doesn't feel like 30 years. It's, it, it's, it's a bit like Christmas rocking up so quickly. <laughs> you know, you, you can still talk about it and, and still remember so much about it and everything is still so vivid. Um, so heading the ball hasn't helped at the moment, affected my marbles in that sense. So, <laughs> um, But yeah, I, I, yeah it, 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 it doesn't seem like, especially when we get back together and sit and chat and have a drink and talk about stuff, you know, whether it's your family or families and <clears throat> your mums and dads, because we knew most of the boys' mums and dads as well, so they used to come and watch the game. So, um, no, it doesn't seem like it was 30 years ago, that's for sure. And as you say, it's so special that you've all, all been through that together and have got that shared experience to reflect on. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. It makes for easy conversation. Yeah, we still we still see quite a lot of the older the older ones. A few more turned up last year. But yeah, it's, it's great to be able to reflect on it. You're also really looking forward to the ex-players' dinner, especially after last year as well, getting the band back together, as it were. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, most. Of, I think we've got. We might have a few more there this year because, again, it was another. It's another big, big year from from our point of view. You know, in terms of it being 30 years. You know, is is hopefully. I mean, when you get Andy Kerr coming over from wherever he came from, Taiwan, Hong Kong, wherever he is, he is now Japan or Canada. Um, and then you got John Kerr turn up, was it last year or the year before? And I mean, it's amazing. These are guys that are travelling, you know, halfway around the world to come to a dinner at their ex-football club. You know, so that that gives you some idea. But yeah, hopefully that we'll have most of them there for this one because it is our last... It's our last one, isn't it, in that sense, in terms of the era, because then it sort of all changed after that, didn't it? No, of course. And I'm sure you've asked before, but what would you say is it that makes Wickham so special? I think that at the time, at the time um, for us, was I think that, that, bond, that bond we all had and with Martin and his team as well, everybody got on really well. And I know we're not, they were nothing, nothing but supportive, um, offering advice and so on and so forth. If you needed something and you asked for it or you wanted a bit of a tip about something, but th- that was really important. But, it, it, you know, it, it was the bond between the players, the group. It didn't matter who came in, where they came from or whatever. They were, they were well welcomed into the into the arms of the lads and, and then became part of that group. Um, I'm sure most of the boys will tell you much the same, but um, that's certainly how I felt about it anyway. And really nice, I think, for people who are, who are perhaps <laughs> 30 or under uh, and, and weren't around for it to, to really hear, you know, about that and, and really reflect on it. And also, of course, equally nice for people that were there and uh, and were, were enjoying, you know, uh, all that you sort of gave uh, for the club. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's I'm some someone I did come to a game. What well, was quite a few of us there for some reason, and um, one of the supporters came up and was like, "Oh, I got like Chris," and I was like, "Yeah, are you all right?" Yeah. And he said, it's great, isn't it? You know, he's still supporting the club and he, he looked he looked well. Obviously, he looked older, you know, as we all do. But um, And it was just nice to be there. And I said to him, I said, well, you know, we were the ones responsible for putting us in this position, which is a nice a nice thing to be able to say, you know. I, I was part of a team that, that, that won or got promoted from the conference and then, and then finished fourth and got promoted from the third, the third division or whatever it was at the time. So yeah, yeah, it's really, really proud of that. Really proud of it because you try and pass on stuff that you've learned and how to do things maybe slightly better or whatever. And some of them listen, and some of them don't. But when the penny drops and they realise that what you're telling them actually helps them become a better player um, by putting yourself three, three or four yards in a different area and 
getting to the ball quicker and you know, giving yourself more time when you've got the ball. You know, they, they do take it on board and listen. So, and that's nice to see as well. I was going to say, is that equally as rewarding as almost doing it yourself, just to be able to pass yeah, on, yeah, yeah, pass on sure, to us? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Especially when you see the results of it and, and when they do it right and, and then they think, oh, Christ, that was easier. And you're like, does it make sense? Now, I had a lad say to me a couple of weeks ago, he said, it, it, when you say about that, Chris, he said, you're absolutely right. He said, I do. but they don't tell you that when you're being coached and you're, co- and you know, when you're being coached in a certain way, they don't tell you that sort of, well, if you get there, it stops you having to do X, Y, and Z, you know. And if you get there quicker and you're there and you're waiting, then you're waiting for it and it happens and you think, oh, actually, that, that works really well. That's made it much easier for me, which is what we, what we need to do. Is the game's not complicated. <laughs> it's a matter of possession of the football. It's not complicated, but it's just it would appear that there's so many, I think, where the coaching does it, and you know, you, I watch teams warm up against us, and teams from step threes and one might have you as well. You're like, wow, they're doing a lot of work before a game, you know. And it must, it must, it must take it out of their legs a little bit, you know. So, um, but it is really enjoyable seeing seeing the um, the outcome of you know any communication that you pass on to the players it is it is really satisfying. Well, it's been really great to speak to you again, and uh, thanks so much for your time. No, you're very welcome, Colin. Cheers, pal. Brilliant chatting to uh, Glenn Creaser earlier on today, especially uh, three years on from his cardiac arrest. Really pleased uh, to uh, to speak to Crease and uh, great that uh, he's doing very well as well. And uh, just to let you know uh, that the uh, dinner is on Friday the 19th. No, it's not. Friday the 15th, that's better, of November. And uh, Crease will be there along with uh, many of his teammates as well. Fascinating to read the comments on the Wickham Wanderers X Players Association Facebook page, including a uh, former guest on this very programme, Jeff Cooper. Uh, he said, true legend uh, with a heart in my the best captain I ever had thumbs up from Steve Guppy uh, another former guest of the show uh, Jim Melvin said top top man and Megan Creaser a big blue heart uh, Megan who we've not had on the show uh, but all the others we've had uh, more uh, from uh, Wickham Wanderers X Players Association on future episodes of this show here on Wickham Sound across High Wickham and South Buckinghamshire and on your smart speaker play Wickham Sound this is Wickham Sound Final part of this week's Wickham Wanderer show. Still to come, uh, we'll hear from the uh, first team men's manager, Matt Bloomfield, and also new academy director, Jeremy Sauer. But first, uh, we'll switch our attention to the women's team. Wickham Wanderers women have uh, their season opener on Sunday. Uh, They kick off the new league campaign. They've got a couple of uh, league games in the coming weeks and then uh, a qualifying round of the FA Cup to come as well. Already on the show, we've spoken to Captain Bobby Lynch. We spoke to Emma Newbury, visiting her parents in Spain and um, the manager Carl Simon as well. Uh, Darcy looks ahead to uh, what's to come in the coming season, including uh, hearing from some of the uh, new signings in the closed season. The players describe their pre-season as mixed with games against the likes of Chesham and Farnham, but can't wait to kick off the new campaign. I think we've been doing very well, working hard every week, and on the weekends, we're doing well, but because we've been playing teams like that are playing above or the league above we've kind of not been winning every week but that's okay purely because it's the experience that matters and I feel like once we then start our actual seasons we'll, we'll be doing really well it's definitely been tough but also we've had like a lot of new players come in so it's been nice like gelling together as a team um, and just seeing what doors open for us really I'm looking forward to the season starting where we all know each other and actually know how we play so we can actually get some wins. There have been a number of summer signings to strengthen the squad, including goalkeeper Amber Taylor, defender Sophie Harvey, midfielder Latifa Mameria and Harriet Bray, who's a striker. A fresh start for myself, but also I think a fresh start for the team. And I think winning promotion is definitely the biggest thing that we want to do. I think it's going to be a tough season. We're going to have to work hard to get promotion, but I reckon as a team, if we work hard, we can complete that challenge. I really enjoyed it. The girls are really friendly and um, I've settled in really well and I've been enjoying the football so far. So yeah, hopefully we can take this into the season. I'm really excited. Hopefully score a few goals for the girls and the team and the club. Milana Kador is just one example of a player who's progressed from the under 18s to the first team. It's very positive, all working together, all there for each other and yeah, the vibes there. Looks like we're going to do really well. Captain Bobby Lynch believes they'll be stronger this season thanks to a blend of youth and experience. We've kept like a real core 
group of players which I feel has been a good foundation and then everyone we've brought in has sort of either slotted in perfectly or elevated us slightly um, to make us yeah an interesting team for this year and hopefully we can push on and get some good results. Manager Carl Simon has high hopes for the team he puts out for the first game. I'm looking for a side that's you know, a lot more attacking, um, a lot more attacking intent, um, that scores goals, that entertains. That's what we're trying to build now. Um, I think we've, we've got that. We've got a lot more experience. We've got a lot of players that we've signed from, from Tier 4, some from Tier 3. Um, so we're looking for that experience now to, to help push us on. The Chair Girls kick off their Southern Region Premier Division season at home to Porchester on Sunday at 2 o'clock with a trip to Chelsea and the visit of Ascot United to come before the second qualifying round of the FA Cup. The team would love your support at Burnham and season tickets are available on the tickets page of the club's website. You can follow their progress on social media, WWFC Women, on X and Instagram and via the Wickham Wanderers Foundation website, as well as hearing from the players each week here on Wickham Sound. Great cheering from Darcy and of course he'll be uh, backing the chair girls throughout their uh, campaign and wish them all the very best for their season opener on Sunday. Uh, turning our attention to the men now and Jeremy Sowers recently appointed uh, the new academy director and Phil's been speaking to him to find out a bit more about his background and what he's got planned. Yeah so I've been involved with academy football for the past 15 years. Um, if I'm rewinding all the way back I actually started at Crystal Palace uh, as a pre-academy coach so uh, the, the sort of local club to me down there and I had my own coaching company as well I was a bit of a jack of all trades and as that was going on I became involved with AFC Wimbledon who we, uh, we were all down there yesterday um, and at the time AFC Wimbledon were obviously non-league and it was a very grassroots youth setup um, with parent managers and kids turning up in Chelsea shirts and Arsenal shirts and all the like of it and we went on a journey, me and a few other people as well, of professionalising the academy. So we went from, I don't know, 2008 uh, through to 2011, developing it as a grassroots setup. Um, and in 2011, the club got promoted via the playoffs against Luton. Uh, and I was there until 2019 in a few different roles, but ultimately for academy manager for six years. And yeah, immensely proud of that work that we did at the, at the club there. It was four players that were on the pitch yesterday that were part of the academy when I was still involved. I then decided that I needed to go and uh, broaden my horizons and see some new things. And uh, I went to West Ham for a few seasons. Um, that was a COVID year, so it was a little bit, a little bit trickier. But I was able then to experience Cat One environments and Premier League clubs, which was really, you know, it, it took my learning on a, a different um, direction uh, and a really positive one. From there, um, I've done a few different bits. I've worked at the Premier League more recently. I've worked at Brighton and Hove Albion in women's and girls football, which is, again, very different. And I suppose the thing that I've always been looking for is a project. That's always what I've, what I've got my teeth into. And that's what Wimbledon was at the time. It was a real project, a real blank piece of paper. So it leads me to today, which is, you know, being here at Wickham. And, and essentially that was, you know, what Dan and Mikhail and Edward pitched me. It was, here's a project, here's a blank piece of paper. We want to go from nothing to something pretty, you know, ambitious. And it was an easy decision for me. I mean, how exciting is it to be in this position to build... Uh, what we've been told will be a leading high-performance academy from the ground up. I mean, that sounds incredibly exciting. It is. It's hugely exciting. Um, and it's why I'm here, because I think I've, I've got to a point in my career now where I've, I've seen the, the full range of youth development setups and academies, and um, I've got quite a clear idea and vision in my head, which I think is aligned to, to what the owners want as well in terms of how to run a high-performance academy. What we want to try and avoid is just being doing the same as what everyone else does. I think innovation is going to be a real core pillar to what we do. And therefore, because there is nothing here at the moment, we're obviously in a privileged position to be able to really think deeply around how we design it and how we build it out. And that's going to be something that's unique and something that I think can stand us out from a crowd, attract talented staff, attract talented players. Uh, and I think that will set us on the course for being different and that, that high-performing academy that you talked about. And I suppose the only thing to, to mention on that is that it's, it's certainly not an overnight journey. It's going to be, it is going to be a long road and it is, it is certainly a project and uh, we're in it for the long haul. And that's what Academy is, right? Like we're going to take 9, 10, 11, 12 year olds through to 18, 19, 20 year olds. And that's, that's a big cycle there. So it's, um, yeah, we're, we're playing the long game with it. We're here to try and support the, the club's medium and long term ambitions. Yeah. Speaking to the fans at Adams Park last Saturday, People very excited about the reintroduction of the academy, mm. and it is about now telling people it is a long-term process. Mm. Uh, just how long does it take, and, sure. and, and what are the, the key sort of milestones that we have to achieve? 
Yeah, that's a great question. I think um, in any high-performing environment, I think like establishing core values and culture is critical. And that was one thing that I knew about this club already from people that I've worked with and, and being around football for so long that it, it's got that, it's got the heritage, it's got the culture, it kind of got, there's, a, there's an identity there that's well-defined. And I think that's the first thing that we're probably going to be anchoring ourselves to, to try and make sure we know exactly who we are. And then I think we set about going on a bit of a journey. And, and the, the vision for that will be to eventually become a Category 1 academy. Um, again, you don't go from nothing to Category 1 in a season or even two seasons or even three seasons. So we're looking beyond that. We're currently working with the EFL, uh, with the Premier League uh, as well, and obviously internally to try and set, set about a roadmap to get to Category 1. Um, the milestones along the way, essentially, if you think of it like uh, schools, you mentioned it to me earlier, Phil, but it is like there's an Ofsted every year to allow you to jump through the different categories. And each category you go through, you're going to need to add more staff to, to it as we go from, let's say, Cat 4 or Cat 3 to Cat 2, then to Cat 1. There's, there's going to be more full-time staff, more part-time staff. Um, facilities and infrastructure will need to, to, to grow in line with the requirements because when they come in and audit us, they're going to have a tick list of things that make us compliant with the rules safe to operate but then they also look at your standards as well so the, the, the last bit of that is how well have we embedded our programs our policies our football philosophy experts come in and they they go okay yeah they, that's where you're at with that now you're, you're you're good you're adequate you're very good whatever else it might be so those will be the the, the milestones um facilities staff and, and embedding your programs and processes those are the three big hitters great hearing from jeremy you can catch more of that chat with phil on wanderers tv uh, manager matt bloomfield spoke to matt cecil after last night's game looking ahead to the trip to blackpool i think it was one of those things that um it was already moved to twelve thirty. you know swansea's derby with with cardiff on sunday just was unfortunate for us to to be on the other end of it Obviously, we rotated the team a little bit tonight, which hopefully should give us some freshness. And, and again, I've said it a number of times, but thank you to, to Mikhail, Edward, and Dan, who have backed us with staying away from, from the next few nights and, and making our way north. So, yeah, we're preparing as much as we possibly can. There's obviously going to be challenges along the way, but um, I hope we'll be ready come 12.30 on Saturday. It's difficult to know what to be ready for. Blackpool have had a roller coaster start to the season. They've changed manager, a four-all draw last weekend, a great win in the Cup like ourselves last night. Um, tough one to prepare for, but a familiar face potentially in the dugout if they haven't made an appointment by the weekend and, and another exciting away game yeah really uh, ever so much so it'll be great to see Keezy someone I think a lot of and um, you know I'm sure he'll have them well drilled he knows all about us because of his time with us so yeah it's going to be um, a tough game absolutely the, the crowd obviously I'm sure they'll be buoyant because they scored four goals last Saturday they've gone and had a really big away win last night so yeah it's going to be buoyant I'm sure and we have to be ready for the task it's the final game of August. It has been a, a you know, tumultuous month. So much going on, so many new faces as well. Uh, any new ones before the weekend? We hope so, yeah. Um, I think you can see from the bags under my eyes, it's been a busy month with all these games and the recruitment. Um, we're still working hard behind the scenes. You know, I think we got hurt last autumn with the, the 12 we had missing. You know, We had a couple of big injuries with Brandon and Luke and Potsy and during that November, December spell, which really kind of hurt us. So we have to be ready ready to, to attack the winter months and we have to get a couple more in. I've been working really hard with, with Dan. He's been um, incredibly backing with the, with the backing that the club have given us. So we hope we can finish it with a couple before the weekend to, to supplement the group because um, you know it's going to be testing moments along the way and we have to make sure we're ready. Manager Matt Bloomfield looking to make uh, at least a couple of new signings before the uh, deadline, uh, which of course is 11 o'clock tomorrow evening. Keep an ear out for any news of that. If you're not going to... Uh, Blackpool on Saturday, you'll hear the whole match live here on Wickham Sound. The kickoff is at 12.30. It's also on Wanderers TV. Uh, join us next week on the show as well. We'll be looking at, uh, back at that game, possibly looking into Mansfield. Well, that might be off because of the international break. We'll have a show anyway. Uh, more from Wickham Wanderers Ex-Play Association, more following Wickham Wanderers Moon, and uh, lots more great chats to bring you as well. Make sure you don't miss it. Uh, check out the podcast as well, which is available uh, normally on a Friday uh, to uh, build up to the game on a Saturday here on Wickham Sound. Have a great week and uh, up the wick.